want you to see this. Allow me to be your eyes. Freaks of the Vine, a controversial podcast answering tough questions regarding issues of the day from a practical biblical world view. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Freaks of the Vine, a very special episode tonight of Freaks of the Vine, and we're uh, always glad that you uh, uh, could tune in and join us for it. Uh, tonight is a very special episode. It is our 20th podcast that we have uh, we have uh, uh, come across, stumbled across, and uh, so we're really grateful that we have um, hit a milestone. <laughs> Big two o, wow! Big Almost drinking age. <laughs> <laughs> One more episode, and he'll be completely legal, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Patrick. Uh, along with me is Mr. Zach. What's up, Miss K? Hello. And our uh, man behind the board, uh, Mr. Gage. Hello. Hello, everybody. It's good to have you back. It is. I'm excited about this one tonight, uh, and and be for multiple reasons. And I, I I think we're gonna talk about tonight music. Um, and specifically, uh, give you, I don't know where all this conversation is going to go in my mind. I know that I would like to present some groups to you that I think have been completely under the radar, which most people who listen to this podcast have never heard of before. And maybe they can go and find it. And when you bring up music and then bring up Christian music, you know, you, you can open a, a box and this can actually be a series, mm-hmm. you know, one night we can talk about. You know, how music came to worship God, and then we can talk about early stages. Is it Christian to listen to heavy music? That can be an entire sure. subject. Yep. I mean, so yeah, this can encap- encapsulate a lot of different topics and a lot of different things. So. Absolutely. I, and, you know, we there are there is a denomination, um, a Church of Christ. They don't do any music other than uh, acapella vocals. Because they think that playing music, and I'm pretty sure that is the denomination. I may stand corrected. Somebody may let me know about that, but I'm pretty sure that's it. And, and they just don't like, they don't believe that uh, God ordains music behind the vocals. It's crazy because you read in the Old Testament, man, and people were blowing trumpets and, oh, yeah. you know, like that. Uh, I forgot what city was being overtaken, but God com- commissioned the trumpet players to march around the city seven times. Yeah, the musicians yeah, got to take yeah, down the walls of Jericho. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So yeah. there's lyres, there's trumpets, you know, there's yeah. harps, there's cymbals. Yeah. You know, if you crash two cymbals together made out of brine, it makes noise. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, God's definitely for music. He absolutely. created it, created the art form for us to express ourselves as another way to just give praise. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, well, what was the angel who was commissioned with music? Yeah, mm-hmm. Mr. Lucifer. Yeah. <laughs> and he so, didn't yeah. like the fact that the music that he was writing or composing was giving God all the glory. He wanted to usurp the glory. That's what the whole thing was the jealousy about. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a whole different topic I'd like to sure. just delve into is the Lucifer, the coordinate, you know, all that. It's just crazy because, you know, just the casual listener can hear that and go, well, that's, that's why... Rocks the devil's music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> devil went down to Georgia for a reason. Foosball's a devil. Hard music's a devil. Everything's the devil. That's right. It's the devil. Um, <laughs> okay, you had uh, actually read up enough to work. How many how many instruments separately are mentioned in the in the Bible? Nine. Nine yes. nine instruments. Yes. So clearly, you know, music is a is a great thing. I believe that it's a form of human expression. And it's, it's a total art. It is art, and art is very, uh, what's the term? Subjective. Very subjective. Subjective means that it differs uh, individually with perspective, and objective means it's factual. That's the difference I learned in school. Because we, we had a whole thing about us being subjective and objective. Objective is saying that this table is made out of wood. You know, subjective is saying, well, I would have made it this way. Or, you know, done the feet. That, see what I'm saying? Okay, yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's differentiating opinion from fact. Gotcha. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, in music, I mean, when you, yeah. I, uh, so, so without going into any great detail, I will just share this small clip it, uh, clip with you about this, and then we'll kind of move from there. But when I, uh, so God did something to me. I, I, I was uh, came a believer. I fell away. When I came back to Him, you young man were a baby, and um, I uh, had quite the vast collection of music um 
all I did, I've worked since seventh grade and probably literally 80 to 85 percent of all, everything I ever made went into purchasing cassettes. So we were there, right? We were just getting into CDs early 90s. So I was I had quite the collection. And um, so when I came back to faith, uh, when I really repented and came back to love him, the first thing that he removed from me, it was a strong conviction of removing all my music, everything. I saved about 30 cassettes and most of those were like ones that like uh, either Christian or ones that I were like, you know, I'm not going to get rid of the Woodstock collection because those are, you know, you know what I mean? They're collector's items. But I, I, I just, he, that was something that was my God. So I got rid of it all. So where am I going to do now? So the first thing I do is I walk into the Christian book and gift located at uh, 10th, 10th in Kansas, 11th in Kansas. And I walked, I think that's right. And I walked in. And I remember looking at this guy named Chad and I said, Chad, I need some help, man. Uh, he goes, what's going on? I'm like, God just removed all of the music from me and I'm okay with this. I'm okay with it. Everybody was going, what are you doing? That collection? I sold it all for a hundred dollars. <laughs> I, I mean, we're, we're probably talking like literally probably 3,500 to $4,000 worth of music. I sold for a hundred bucks. I just wanted it out of my life. But that guy looked at me and he goes, wow. Okay. Well, uh, good thing is. They had cassettes that you could throw and headphones on in the end of every aisle and you oh, could yeah. listen to the music. You sample could sample it. it. I remember that. And I remember um, mm -hmm. picking up a couple of tapes right off the back. Actually, I went ahead and bought discs and uh, that was my journey. Within a couple of weeks, couple of months, I knew that people had to hear this. So I went on this journey of trying to get a radio program. And then within about eight months later, I was hosting a, my first radio show. We got fired in two months. They did. They thought we were a little bit too crazy for their liking off of uh, Joy 88 back in the day. Good riddance. And I moved over to um, KBUZ, 90.3 FM and here in Topeka. And that was a, an American Family Radio um, a subsidy or whatever. I guess it would be an affiliate. And they let us have a Saturday night program. Went from an hour, then eventually two hours. And then those two hours... I used to take Zach with me all the time on Saturday nights. Yep. I remember that was one of my first prominent memories as a child was mm -hmm. going up with dad to a radio station. And you know, there was a, the room where they did all the recordings and the on-air side would come on. And I was told, okay, when that comes on, you know, I was giving the whole instruction. <laughs> and, but and I had toys and then there was like a candy machine in the corner I was in heaven. Yeah. You know, but it was, you, know, you could see through the, the glass wall, basically. So, you know, you were monitoring. But I just remember... You know, all these people coming in. And, we had an open studio. Yeah, it was awesome. Like, people would show up and just hang out for a while. And I, I just remember being, like, just blown away as a kid. Like, this is so cool. You know, I get to listen to music and uh, hang out with Dad at midnight. <laughs> yeah, so we would go to the church on Saturday night and then go up there and do the show. And that's why you could stay up there with me late. And Mom was okay with it. But we had, um, we had, uh, we played everything that nobody else would play. So here, that I set all that up to say this. When you think of Christian music, first of all, generally what you hear is you think of praise and worship, praise and worship music is what it's called. Contemporary music is the other one. So uh, I can name off artists. The point is, is, uh, you know, you, you think you have a boxed idea of what it is. If I said Christian rock, most people that didn't know anything about it would look at me and go, oh, like Striper Creed. Yeah, they, right. right. Yeah. So there was Bands always like that always got thrown in. Precisely, yeah. POD the bands yeah. that whoever was popular in that time, whatever genre they were, that's where everybody's brain went to. Okay, mm -hmm. the problem is and was and still is, is there is an amazing, an amazing library of music that nobody knows about. Correct, which is so funny. The timing that you surrendered all of your non-christian music and you walked in and guy this is just it, it happened in a span of about 10 years it hasn't happened since it probably won't happen again but from the 90s to the early 2000s there was this explosion of underground music that not only was incredible musically and awesome to listen to at the times but also gave glory to god yeah and i just it blows me away looking back that my dad you know my mom and dad as young parents as a young married couple you know having me at 19 and 20 right yeah I, I was i was there pretty early with oh, yeah. dad. and just to see how much the music impacted my parents in such a light in such a positive way for us 
for me and my sister growing yeah. up. It was just awesome, and it just happened at the perfect time, and the timing syncopated itself perfectly. But well, and it was a wonderful time because at that point, um, you know, nobody was playing the music, right? So I would buy, I would get a CD, and 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 a lot of time, like the, I remember, Chad like gave me a bo- like a bag of CDs, like here, borrow these and see what you like. So I'd go home and I'd open them up, and we were living in this mobile home uh, park. And I'd open up the disc and I'd write down their number and I would call from a um, somebody who had like like either at my job or at the radio station. We had like a, you know, international book back then. You guys couldn't just call across the country <laughs> costing a lot of money for people who had yep. a landline. But I would call the radio or the um, the record companies and I'm like, hey, we started a show. OK, well, how many hours are you? We're not a reporting. So you had to play at least 10 hours a week for you to be called considered reporting. So like, you know, how like there's a top 10, you know, list of billboard out right now. Those are that's why they choke down like radio stations will play the same thing over and over again because they're mm-hmm. reporting. Well, back in the early 90s, this was a, an interesting time because corporate radio had not swept the nation yet. They were starting to build some steam, but a lot of radio stations were still privately owned. There was a smooth jazz station in Kansas City, right? And it was in some dude's house or something, you know, and you could, you know, as long as you had all the, all the parameters of the FCC, um, you could get away with doing this. So we were in a really unique time of our history where you could do radio. Well, and also, um, a lot of radio stations had got away from just playing what they wanted. Like in the 70s, 60s, 70s, early 80s, the best radio stations played whatever they wanted to play right, right in Cleveland. Yeah. Um, that lady played the, the, she was a female disc jockey. She played working man by rush. That's how rush got their, uh, acc- uh acclamation at the very beginning. Cause she was working as a man like a seven and a half, eight minute long song. Yes. Yeah, she, she'd play it's not it radio bathroom. friendly. Right. Right. Hold on quote. So yeah, <laughs> it, t- it took off. People were like, Oh wow. Is this new Zeppelin? And she's like, no, it's a band called rush out of Canada. So, so these are by people you could play what you wanted to play. It was called college radio because college radio stations could play whatever they wanted. Right. So we're an interesting time here in the early 90s where this is kind of all changing, but yet we had some freedom. Going from glam metal and the, and the grunge. We were right in the grunge time. So, so right when Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, and the secular realm were, were taken off, um, the glam metal, which Christianity had a lot of Christian metal bands, we're getting all of a sudden now all glam metal, all hair band metal was just being sufficed, right? So you were in this really weird wave. So as these progressive groups, these sort of new grunge bands were being signed in the secular realm, Christian metal or on rock already had it. Yeah. They were already in insane. Seattle, Los Angeles. Yep. Mortal and Precious Death were number one and number two finished number one and number two in the Los Angeles, um, the Los Angeles County battle of the bands. They're two Christian rock bands. Nobody knew that. Like nobody knew that Well, they were just, they voted for them and they uh, mortal and precious death. You're talking about a time where, where Christian music was, they were signed. These labels were signing people. So I would call a label. And I'd say, Hey, we're not a reporting station. We play two hours of music a week, but nobody. Okay. Well, how strong is your station? We're 50,000 watts on a Saturday night. Anybody who was in, in the record business knew that everybody turned their signals down because Saturday nights, nobody was listening or really was listening to radio as much. You could mm-hmm. or you did, but you turned down your wavelength, right? So you didn't have all the infighting of all the frequencies. Mm-hmm. So 50,000 watts from Topeka would actually go like well over 70, 80 miles up to Nebraska out past Manhattan, Kansas, you know, we would go to Kansas city, we'd go south. So we were getting a lot of listener all of a sudden, like we would do, we would, we would have a call in thing and our light, we only had two lines <laughs> and they were lit up the whole time. And people were like, I've been trying to call and trying to call. And I'm like, what? And rich, our, our station manager was, uh, our first one was Lisa Masson. She was the one that really let us get started. Lisa retired, became a mom. So she stepped away and rich came on and Rich is older, and I thought he wasn't going to let us do this. And Rich was, <laughs> Rich gave us two hours. Then he said, "Look, do not fail me. Play whatever you want to play." He's like, "You've got a captive audience here," and I'm like, "We're not playing contemporary." He goes, "Good." So we played death metal. We played gangster rap. We played all college alternative. We played everything that nobody else was playing. And record companies, when they knew we were doing it, would ship me 
like a box of 20, 30 you CDs. You guys should have seen the wall. <laughs> we would get of these. CDs in this radio station. I mean, it was absolutely it was, magnificent. It was, it was the size of this wall, and Dad had it completely organized alphabetically. Dang. But I mean, like the A would, was like four feet tall. Wow. Just the eggs. <laughs> yeah, like, K- it, it was ridiculous. The yeah. It, the amount K-Buzz of late night would start. Um well, we had this little tiny section and pretty soon we grew and grew and grew so much. Rich had to put in a whole new rack for a like a yeah. big, big wall <laughs> it rack. It was insane. Skillet just started mm-hmm. and they came to our station. Yeah. On a Saturday night. Yep. And 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 and, and, and talked to. Uh, we were out wow. of town, so one of the guys who was covering got to interview them. And then we had um, Pillar was out of Salina, uh, Hayes, Hayes, Kansas. And Pillar kind of blew up there for a number of years. And Pillar, those oh, guys. Oh, one of my favorite bands. Pillar it's blew so us awesome. up. They kept calling Rich and going, would you please have him call us? And so I finally called them and they're like, yeah, all these bands wanted to be interviewed. So think about Saturday night. Fridays and Saturday nights, a lot of these bands are around, around the country. So I would call their promoter and then they were like, yeah, they're in Spokane, Washington, Saturday night. Um, that's two hours behind you. So yeah, they can probably call in right at like 1115 and I'm like, awesome. So they would get done with their show, cool off for a minute. And then we'd get guys from tourniquet. We interviewed deliverance. We interviewed bride. We interviewed all these bands. I mean, everybody, I mean, star flyer 59, Johnny Q public, all these groups that, and it was, it was great. And then we had a late, a girl who lived in Linden, Kansas, who recorded a bunch of our episodes. And then one day showed up to the, the, uh, the station and gave me a box of tapes, which I still have at home of the interviews. <laughs> wow. And I was like, you sister are amazing. So a lot of cool stuff happened in this seven year oh, period absolutely. until I walked away in 2001. It was time for me to, uh, I was, it was a volunteer thing and I it was time for me to hand the reins over and, and it was the right time to do it. But I bring all that up because there was a, as Zach said, there was a 10 year period of music. And I, and I think music is, ah, it's art, but it's a lost art sometimes, you know, like, uh, you, you hear in a God of Vida, it's a secular song, right? By Iron Butterfly. 18 minutes long. <laughs> doom, 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 yeah. doom, it's the same riff over and there. I got out of me, and I got a You know, <laughs> nobody plays that anymore. They play a three and a half minute version. How do you trim a 18 minute song down the, you know? So it's a lost art. Most of the stuff is repetitive, but there's a lot of great music out there. Um, so wh- when it comes to music, what is your guys' favorite? What has been your favorite, or what, what are some groups or artists that you've liked over the years? That is secular or Christian? Let's just throw it out there. Who wants to take it first? Go ahead, Kay. <laughs> well, I I am a person that just, I love music. I love all different kinds of genres of music. And so I, I'll listen to just about everything and anything. Be specific. Give me somebody that you really liked. Okay. Growing up, Bob Seger, Pat Benatar. Okay. And those were just my favorite, all time favorite when I was, I don't know, 17, Love 18, Bob Seger. Absolutely. 19 years old. Yeah, you can't go wrong with Bobby. That's awesome. Yeah. What about you, Gage? Uh, when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of Reliant K. Oh, yeah. I remember them. Yeah. Yep. They uh, ran on. Did you ever listen to Cutlass? Yep. Yep. Cutlass with a K. So more like, like new metal type stuff in a yeah. sense. Kind of the yep. Reliant K is not much metal. No, they're not. They're more uh, college uh, rock punk. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, what about you, Zach? I mean, you've been all over the board, but just <laughs> give us a couple groups that you over that you secular and secular and Christian. Well, listening to you and mom play your guy play the music as a kid. I mean, that was our music was just part of our life, you know, cooking dinner, whatever music's playing in the living room. Saturday morning, we wake up, you eat some breakfast, and at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, you turn on that stereo and you get cleaning for three hours, right? Yeah. Like, just music was part of everything that we did in the car, all that. And one of the very first bands I can remember just being captivated by and spinning around in the living room as mom's making Hamburger Helper and you're working, you know, the 20 hours of the 24 hours of the day back, oh, yeah. <laughs> back then to support us it was Iron Maiden. I remember listening to Wasted Years. And caught somewhere in time and just, it, it put me in a trance. And what's funny about Iron Maiden is that, yeah, they are a secular band, but Nico McBrain, their drummer, is a born-again Christian. 
Yeah. And very he, outspoken and he's about it. Very too. outspoken about it. Uh, has crosses um, etched into his toms, like just whatever way he can pay homage, you know. And he was talking about um, the governor. And he's like, and this one right here, you know, paying homage to the governor, the all time governor upstairs. <laughs> like just the way he goes into it. This is the drummer for Iron Freaking Maiden. Like yeah. the number of the B six 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 was on one of their album covers. Yeah, it was. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah, I, Maiden captivated me. Bride. Bride is a great Christian was, band. Was a great one. There's a video of me three years old lip singing, lip syncing to one of the Bride songs that you recorded. I have it on. I have it on uh, on film, and I'm going to put it on disc. And uh, that kid. <laughs> we, we had borrowed a camcorder and he did the core. He'd mouth, he, he lip synced at two years old, uh, a song called uh, Picture Perfect by Bride. And it was hilarious. And I, I wish we would have sent it into one of those America's Funniest Some Videos because it was on on par. <laughs> it was on par. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it probably, I mean, just anything that dad and mom listened to, I, I love too. She loved, and we, we started to. Uh, except for, <laughs> there's a couple of bands now that I love that I couldn't stand then. One of them was Steely Dan. <laughs> Every time you, mom, or like grandma would play Steely Dan, oh my girl, turn this off. My ears are bleeding. Yeah. Like, stop. That's, and then now. That's exactly how I feel about Patsy Klein. Really? <laughs> <laughs> See, there's always somebody that does it but too. I, but I can, I can listen to Steely Dan now and just be in heaven. Like, it's just, I, I can totally I'm, I'm enjoy a, yeah. Steely Dan. But so, yeah, I mean, probably I, I was enamored with, with rock. As a kid, I was um, the youngest of ten sons, and so I am the youngest of ten boys. And so i I had one brother in particular. All of them liked music, but I had one in particular, um, Dennis, who died in uh, nineteen eighty five. Um, uh, he he was a huge music junkie, and he I learned I, I learned I remember my earliest memories of four or five years old of listening, getting home and pop and throwing on um, Molly Hatchet and Yes. And then when I was in eight years old, I remember uh, listening all the time, every day to the best of Joe Walsh. <laughs> um, it was, and he was in the Eagles as well, but he had a solo career and his solo stuff to this day is some, a lot of memories, but turn to I, stone. Oh uh, yeah. Turn to stone and uh, County fair and all these things. So I had this, this background of music. And so music was always very important to me growing up uh, of all types. I mean, my fit, one of my favorite artists of all time is uh I, I, I shared a memory of her today on, yeah. on Facebook and it's Carol King. King yeah. uh, one of the greatest albums of all time called tapestry was remained on the billboard uh, top 100 for uh, right at 11 years. Uh, that, that album and dark side of the moon by pink Floyd are the longest running albums ever to stay on the billboard top 100. Um, Carol King's amazing. So I have this, I, and my mom was like big into like Neil Sedaka and Neil diamond. I, I, there's a lot of, you know, so I had this really interesting Gordon Lightfoot, Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I, so I had this vast upbringing in music, so it wasn't hard for me to spot something, especially in Christian music. So, you know what I mean? That it was like sticking out. And so I'd like to throw to you guys, um, a couple of bands and a couple of, of genres, uh, right now that, um, I think are overlooked if you guys don't mind. So, um, I have them memorized. Um, I'm pretty sure I have them memorized. I'm going to start first on the low end uh, of, of softiness and move up. So I had three groups. Don't go I, like level of intensity, level of intensity. There you go. Yeah. Um, I'm Sonic th value because the lyrics for the, for the softer songs can be just as piercing as the heavy. Okay. Voice. And so before we get started on this, I want you to kind of, before we really get there, cause I, when we get to the metal stuff, I, I want to address this and just the elephant in the room. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I can't stand rap as a genre of music. However, there are certain rap artists in the Christian realm that I think are even the secular that have stuck out to us, you know, but the, the Christian, there's, there's some good ones. There's some really good artists. So when you talk about the sound, the sonic level of Christian or of any kind of metal, a lot of times people just don't care for it, the hard rock, but there's a lot of people who do. And a lot of them, however, are Christian that are Christian kids are not, you know, so Iron Maiden is nothing compared. Like I know there was a song called number of the beast, you know, and then there's a story behind we that can song, that's, right? That's episode by itself. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but they're, they're, they weren't slayer, no. right? <laughs> so side. slayer, deer side, who actually, who talked about uh, anti-God. Correct. And that's the thing. So there's. So in the secular, you know, when there's kids coming up now and they're like, what, Pat, hey, Pastor Patrick, what do you think about this band? And they're a secular band. I go, 
Yeah, I'd be very careful with them. However, if you like them, check out these guys, right? So I still, I don't want to go, you can't listen to secular music because it's the devil, right? Again, right. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to throw water on their fire. No, and there's, there's a huge steer mis them. misconception of, of, of heavy music. I mean, there's people who can, you know, understand that, oh, okay, yeah, that music's cool. It's not for me, but I can see why you might like it. Yeah. You know, and then there's others, you know, like, well, I, there's no reason to be that angry. There's no reason to be that upset or. Good you know, point. You know, I think you like, two need to talk about why it, by why it doesn't bot why, what it does for you. I think you and Gage need to talk about that. Well, it's statistics show. Research has been shown that kids who listen to heavy music play violent video games yep. are right. way less likely to commit violent acts of crime or anything else. Yeah, it's you an only hear the other side yep. of it, but Absolutely. it's an outlet for them. They get it's a complete outlet. Out. It's a complete outlet. So if they're going to listen to heavy music real quickly, Gage, and I want you to respond like that, what, what Zach just talked about, but when you talk about when heavy music, uh, if it's an outlet, why, why would they... It, you want to steer. You want to give them some good stuff. If they're going to listen to something heavy, they're not listening to it because of the lyrics necessarily. They're listening to the aggression. So we, you want to kind of help them get here. Here's some good stuff. Here's some you know. Here's some stuff sure. that is really positive. So so when it what about for you? What does it do for you? Yeah. So a, a lot of the emotion with it, I think, is something that a lot of people can relate to. Um, I know previously my music choices weren't always in the right. But um, it was just, like you said, an outlet somewhere I can go to and relate to the song. So Okay. 100%. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the Christian side of it, though, I think there's a, it's a lot deeper when it comes to that emotional tie with it. The, you know, sitting there and listening to these, like, rough songs, the heavy guitar, uh, like the double bass pedal on the drum just going off right like that's fun but then you get to the christian side and it's a deeper message and an understanding of you know sometimes you listen to a song where it's a guy just i mean crying out for god you know trying to figure out where he stands or um you know the pain of the world that's affecting him versus the love that he finds through christ i think uh now it's it's more you know like it's like you said music is an art and before I like, you know, I could appreciate it, but now it, it has a whole different meaning through mm -hmm. Christian metal. That's a great way to put it. Okay. When you hear, when I know you've sampled some of the, cause when we were talking about doing this, you listen to some, uh, bands. Did, what, what is overall, uh, did, did you, what did, did you like what some of what you heard? Yeah, I, I do. Um, and do you feel evil when you hear like any? You know what I mean? Do you, you no, see what I'm getting at? I, I don't. And and we were just having this conversation earlier, and we were talking like, I like the throaty, the real, you know. It, but sometimes I can't understand exactly what they're saying. So right, you have to right. get the lyrics, and once you get the lyrics, and then you can see um, what exactly it is that they're the the message that they're putting out there. Um, it's, most people don't like the throat. Right? They, yeah. you know, I tell you what, we have to play for you, Phil Bozeman, sometime. That's what set the point. <laughs> so, well, okay. Well, but I was just kind of curious to your take when you started listening to some of this stuff. So we've got some bands that I want to share with you, um, if you don't mind. So, well, going back real quick. Sure, on please. Just the music. So, you know, being a kid, as we were engaged in the time that we were, um, there was the, the upper echelon of popular kids. And then there's everybody else. That music reached everybody else. It's for the outcasts. It's for the rejects. That's it's for the point. people who are not accepted by blonde, beautiful cheerleader and Mr. Jock with the perfect fade and the, you know, and the awesome jawline. And he was born with a six pack. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like we can love, we appreciate the neighbors, all that. But there's something to be completely ostracized from everything. And when you're bullied and harassed and you go through back when you could actually get bullied and be harassed because it does refine you to be a person later on in life. Not saying kids need to be bullied, but there's something to be said about dealing with adversity at a young age that prepares you for adversity later in life. Amen. That's a topic for another day. But for those outcasts, for those rejects, for the kids who, who don't belong, there is music for us. And then next thing I know, I find out that there's a faith-based 
yep. group that exists in that. And there was a revival of people like who can, you can have a faith in Christ and listen to this music and saints. If we were to do anything is to be a light in every Avenue of our life. That's right. So in the world of heavy music where you associate it with the devil and the demon horns and six, six, six and evil and whatever, shouldn't we evangelize that place more than anything? Amen to that. Yeah. Shouldn't we be there to answer their questions and to be a light and show that this can be done and we can listen and do and play this music too? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something to add to that. I remember um, <laughs> I remember on the bus ride one time, I was playing um, like Lamb of God or something like that. <laughs> and it was just, it was probably super loud because the person behind me tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, this song reminds me of you. And I don't know why, but that just like, it really hurt. I was like, mm, I don't know how you remembered this song. That's <laughs> yeah, right. funny. <laughs> right. Yeah. I remember so playing. I like, maybe I should mix this up. Yeah, so. for sure. I remember um, I was 15. It was right before I started driving myself to school. I had to get the whole restricted license parameters knocked out. But, you know, it was a pain in the butt. But uh, I would ride to school with Dustin and we'd pick up Courtney and Jerry would ride with us sometime. And there would just be a group of us, you know, all the way to Tweet High. And I remember at the start of sophomore year, right before school started in the summer, we went like back to school shopping and Blackstone Cherry came out with their debut album. I was like, oh man, I'm, you know, uh, Lonely Train. It oh was yeah. A great song. Like, uh, yeah, gonna, it's like Southern Rock. It's is total it is. Southern Rock. It's, yeah, yeah. It's really good. Really good stuff. So um, was, I was just wanting, I wanted it. Everyone to hear this music because I liked it so much too. So I remember bringing it with me and we were on our way to school and I, I popped it in and it's not like, it's not heavy. It's not hardcore. No. I remember Corey popping off. She goes, well, Zach and his, I hate my mom music. I was like, wow. Like, like no, I love my mom. <laughs> like, <laughs> and she helped me get the CD. Like, but that's, that's the conception. That's yeah. the mentality yeah. Yeah. Of, of people who listen to stuff like that. Yeah. And who who don't like it and and hear it. But anyway, let's transition to what you were going into. So I want to give you guys some artists and I'm going to give you three different genres of of rock. Okay. We're going to start lighter. We're going to work heavier. And I'm going to give you a couple of groups. I limited it to three and three groups, not by popularity. Three groups that I felt like were the most underrated bands of all time in this particular genre in the Christian realm. So the first area is kind of what we call the alternative rock, college rock, um, alternative music. Like Laser 105.9. <laughs> Back in the day, day yeah. yeah. So these are going to be groups that are kind of in that, um, they're in rock section, but they're going to be kind of that that Nirvana, um, Pearl Jam uh, vein, okay? Uh, the first one I'm going to uh, share with you is a group called Silage. Silage is um, S I L A G E. Yes, yes, and um, Silage is going to be a a group that um, I they only had two two albums that came out. Um, the first one was kind of ska ish. You know, they had like some ska music is basically um, punk rock with horn section. Yep, and they had huge. Some, Never thought it would die. Right. Never thought ska would go away, but it did. It did. <laughs> uh, there's still some ska bands around now, but they kind of had some elements of that. Then, but their second album because they refined their sound, and their second album is called Vegas Car Chasers. And Vegas, incredible, and one of the most incredible albums I think of all time, especially in the decade of the '90s and ever since. So, um, you can check them out, and 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 then what you do is, of course, like if you have like if you don't have Spotify, it's okay, but like Spotify is one of those uh, ones you go into. When you do find an artist, you can go down and it always has suggested artists. And that's the mm-hmm. kind of nice way you can, but you don't know where to start. So that's, that's where they were innovative. Um, the lead singer um, is still in a band today is it's actually, the band is called in parallel and they are out of Nashville, Tennessee, and they are very, very unique and very different, but beautiful band. The second one I want to bring up is a uh, grandma train. Grandma train is probably one of those groups that they came out, they were really rough. A lot of band, a lot of these bands I'm telling you about, they were rough on their first album because they just didn't have a lot of money behind it. Based on the success of that first album, they got more money in their second or third album. Grandma Train actually released an album a few years ago, another one they got back together, three-piece band. Um, they have a lot of um, a, a beautiful uh, songs um, in the sense that there's a lot of melody, there's um there's a lot of drive behind their music the the, the rhythm section solid their song, guitar Jonah 
is incredible. Yeah. It's short 244 or whatever. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> taking the story of Jonah and Nineveh and making a song. Out of it. And, and, and talking about how you can relate to what he goes through. Yeah. I mean, you know, these are, uh, it's a, it's an amazing band. And the third, the third group, I really, man, I struggled with, with my third band. Okay. But what I did was I, I, I finally settled on this one and because there's no, the other two were the ones I settled on. My first band in this, in this vein is without a doubt, Common Children. Common Children's first album was like whenever somebody would say, "Well, wh- what's a Christian alternative to um, Nirvana?" I would give, the, I would tell them Common Children's first album. Then their second album came out, and they were it was different. It was different than the first album. It was more refined, a little bit more. You know, there's some sharpness to it. And then there by the third album, they were they they were above everybody else in, in my book. Not for everybody, you know. You can't you can't. I don't even know how to explain this, but this is the interesting thing. Their third album had a lot of symphonic elements to it. This is Delicate Fade. Uh, Delicate Fade is actually the second album. The third one is In Between Time. Okay. So the third album was sort of like their launching pad to what's called Hammock now. Hammock, if you cert- it's funny. If you go into Spotify, you can see how many times people have played Common Children songs. And I think their top five songs have only been played over 10,000 times each. And probably most of those are from Zach and I. Anyway, <laughs> honestly. But uh, at the the lead singer and the bass player went on to form a group called Hammock, and they are wildly known for doing um, music that you can, like life music. You know, so like, you know, Yanni is, is very popular. It's that is is not like Yanni, but it hammock has a whole catalog, millions of listens. I mean, it's like the same band, but it's not the same. It's so like the drummer got kicked out and then they blew up from there. But one thing I, I think is really cool about um, Common Children is just their their element of surprise. And and that was why I named them my third group. The the uh, uh, Zach, any comment on those three bands? Silage, Grandma Train, and Common Children. Yeah, can't go wrong with either one of those. Um, did you throw Pillar and Plank Guy in there? No, I was only limiting it to three, but okay, yeah, great point. Plank Guy is one that I, I, I wanted to actually put on there, but I did. I went with Grandma Train instead. Yeah. Plank Guy is amazing. Um, and Pillar, yeah, they're they're a great group in that whole sort of college Pillar, rock. Pillar was one of my favorite bands as a kid. Yeah, they did some rap stuff. They did some funk. They did, but it was all metal. They didn't really do rap. No, they didn't really do rap. I thought they did. Maybe they did early on, but no, um, Pillar was more of just. You know what they reminded me of? Their first album was like Three Eleven, so kind of rap, lightly rapish, but not really okay. rapping. Yeah, my, the first one I got into was Fireproof. Okay, yeah, that was like and the then second. Where or third. do we go from here? Was their second one. But, okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, good, hard good rock. Picks. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Um, so the hard rock section, um, I have three bands that I I picked easily. Um, I'm going to start with Detritus. Detritus is actually out of Australia, and there are other groups named Detritus. By the way, it's all on how you spell it. Um, there are other bands that are secular, but Detritus, the Christian band, their their second album is called it But for One, and a lot of real deep fans of this band. Let me let me let me shine a little light on you. Remember when eBay was like the place you can go and get a lost disc before you could have Spotify mm-hmm. or YouTube? I went to go bid on if but for one a CD. Um, it went for hundred and twelve dollars on eBay. There was no way that your mother would have let me get that for hundred and twelve dollars <laughs> no without killing me first. Yep. But they that was how badly they were wanted. They set their first album by all their fans love them. Okay. I not a big fan of the first album. The second one, if but for one set a trend in metal. It's some of the best heavy music you will listen to. The, the fact that they, he took like a sailor's farewell bidding <clears throat> goodbye. He like, sings a song he as, sings a, as a pirate. Skipper. Going. It's in ah, better with, places with this like riff ever and did double that. bass groove in the background. You're just like, what is this? But why can't I stop listening to it? Right. It's, it's <laughs> incredible. And they had another and song. Feel, it, it's a two and a half minute long song. It's a prayer. And it, it's an acoustic song when hits with him singing out. You know, even when I can't um, 
or gosh, I'm forgetting the lyrics, but uh, it, it's just like he just cries this out, and, you're, and you can just feel it. Yeah, it's you the same album. Them. Yeah, it's and they had another one where they um, they actually in the middle of this metal song. The, yeah, instead of a guitar, chest. instead of a guitar solo by either one of the guitar players, they throw out a, a sax, a tenor saxophone solo, and it's sixteen measures long, and it's beautiful. Over a metal song, you just hear this beautiful melody of a sax. And another one they did, they they the first time I'd ever heard grindcore was mm-hmm. the title track. They did it. He sung it in grindcore, and coming out of the song, it has a piano solo for the last two minutes. They did something that nobody else will ever, ever be able to pull off. Absolutely. And and it was it was one of the greatest albums ever. But anyway, Detritus, and they, their new album just came out one year ago, and I'm super stoked. It's really good. It's different than their old stuff, but I like a band that evolves. Uh, Deliverance. They they A lot of people have heard of them before, but the fact that early on they were a thrash metal band, okay, in the late 80s, early 90s, they switched. They went to more of a progressive rock. So when early on stu- their stuff early on was was you know not everybody's into thrash and all that. They're one of the greatest progressive. They are they are the greatest progressive rock Christian band ever ever. I I, I can't I can't even begin to, to tell you how much that 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 <laughs> the the album that did everything for me was River Disturbance. It is one of the greatest, and it came out in 1995, and 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 it it set a precedence and it blew me away, and I. I, I thought we were listening to something special then going back now. There are people who talk about that album coming out and they're like, I've never heard a Christian band rise to a level. It was better than normal. If it was played on regular radio, it would have been the out. It would have been one of the top five albums of the year in secular, but it wasn't because they're a Christian and they, and Jimmy Brown wears that very pridefully. He doesn't care. Um, so deliverance, um, look up river disturbance album and the th- final third band precious death. Um, I mentioned them earlier, Christopher Scott, uh, I found him, uh, recently on, uh, through the wonderful social media platform of Facebook, but they are actually back to, they're writing new material for a comeback album. And I can't tell you how much that band means to me. That's a band that I remember dad listening to an awful lot as a kid, that, that Navy blue, dark blue, sea blue cover with the bright red lettering if you must mm-hmm. on the on the front like dad listened to that all the time as a kid it, I it's it's fantastic the I'm, other one was uh, machine fish by galactic cowboys yeah galactic listen to that one a lot yeah too. galactic cowboys's machine oh, fist album geez. is one of the best album it is one of the greatest rock albums of don't all time. get the horse the bud bot no i made the mistake at hastings like, oh dad do you know that galactic cowboys has a new album out no, buy it. I will bring it home. What the is this? <laughs> it was it was their it's follow up. <laughs> it's their follow up to this wonderful. I mean, and it has great storyline behind yeah, it. Like, okay, it is. But so Monty Colvin, the bass fo- player, but you follow up. I know Machine Fish. Man, Monty Colvin, the bass player, is an amazing guy. Um, I'm friends with him. Uh, I found uh, we've talked from time. Sorry, to time. Marty, if no, I don't mean any disrespect, guys. Like, well, I know he, that he, that's your music, and it's just not my personal cup of tea. Well, he wrote about it, the horse, the bud bike, because his his father actually sold everything to join a cult with his family, and he was one of the kids. They had moved to the mountains and did all that. So there was a point he bought a horse, and the cult leader like got very angry with him buying a horse. So that he wrote an album called The Horse That But I mean, the story behind it's amazing. But album wise, it's nothing like Machine Fish. It's like literally the Beatles coming out with, I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's just this big fall off. But Machine, Machine Fish is one of the greatest. My third, um, but my third and favorite uh, band with that was Precious Death. And so you should check them out. Okay. I'm going to move to the final category today, and that is metal. By the way, if if you're gone, I'm here. My precious death was played on a secular radio station. It would be one of those songs that you would hear played at the top of the hour every hour. It is one of the best rock songs. Like it reminds you a lot of Candlebox. I don't know if you guys remember them. They had Far Behind was huge in the '90s. Change, change, don't you? Um, it's just they have a, they had a very unique guitar tone. I'm not even going to try to explain it. No, but. you're good. But yeah, I, I remember playing yeah. uh, that song at a party. I went to, I was the first time I went to a New Year's Eve party where I was deciding not to 
uh, consume beverages. And I was, I was pretty fairly young, but this has come out and I was doing the radio program and I remember playing that song. Um, I took over the stereo from this guy. I was like, do you mind if I play this? And I remember watching everybody in that place by halfway through the song, their reaction, they're all, you know, they had no idea who I was playing, but everybody was into, it was almost like, like the, a wave of everybody just like, man. And I had a couple guys looking over me like, who is this? And I, I remember that feeling of going, if you only knew, if you only knew this band and Christopher Scott, the lead singer who wrote all their lyrics is one of the most fire, fire breathing, passionate Christians I've, I've ever heard speak before his love of God, his love for the word of God. He could preach it. And every time they played a show, everybody knew who they stood for. And, and, and he's still around and he's still, he loves God. He's still doing the same thing. He just doesn't have any hair anymore. You know, you know we grow right. Up. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I want to move to the metal category now to help everybody kind of follow along in the metal. Um, I'm going to go with X toll at first. X toll is one of those groups that they're out of another country and they, they fuse um, a lot of progressive music to it and they're very heavy, but they're really beautiful. And I just thought that they should get some run because they get really overlooked. And again, these are Fair. my... Un- That's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, and these are my the most underrated, I think. I, I, I could talk about Demon Hunter, but everybody knows who they are. True. I'm not talking about the popular ones. The next one um, is Tourniquet. And I think that Tourniquet is one of the greatest bands of all time. And they their, their entire um, category is started in 1990. And it's still going. That's the band that I associate you with the most. Like, if you know, like someone, oh, what's one of your dad's favorite metal bands? Tourniquet. Yeah. They, they were, yeah. You love that band. Their third album, their third album is called, um, <laughs> this popped out of my head. Is gauge. it the one with Houdini? Uh, no, that's Banishing Lessons, the fourth right. album. The that's third fair. album, the f- third album was the last one with their original lead singer, Guy Ritter. And it just path, path pathogenic ocular, ocular dissonance. I knew it'd take me a second. I kept wanting to say the telescopic realm of the, mic, uh, the microscopic, microscopic view, view of the, the telescopic, telescopic realm. realm. They have awesome, <laughs> awesome so names. Yeah, the third <laughs> album and the second and third album. Um, so the drummer, the founder of the band, his dad was a uh, surgeon, and so he used surgical names in, in the to explain the Bible. It was actually really really unique, and it was the lyrics are amazing. Their third album, though, uh, Pathogenic Ocular Dissonance, is one of the greatest metal albums, bar none. It is up there with Master of Puppets by Metallica. Period. I don't care what anybody says. The top 10 best albums of all time, secular or Christian, Pathogenic Ocular Dissonance is one of the greatest. And it is the most underrated album of all time by that band. Everybody talks about their first album, their fourth album, and other ones. And their third album and no, most bands kind of stumble, you know, after they start off really popular, they totally, they totally hit it. That is just one of those albums you put on and you're like, what are they? And there's and one of these songs, you know how those little vocoder things when people lose their voice from smoking cigarettes, the song starts and he goes, when you're silent in the air. And then they start jamming and the guy sings through it to get the point across about not smoking cigarettes and losing your lungs. I just... Who does that? <laughs> Arc, of, <laughs> Arc of Suffering. Arc of Suffering was on their first album yeah. about um, a harming of animals. Animal abuse and animal testing and products that we use animals for and how we ruin um, a man's or a dog's trust in man by proving what we already know. <laughs> it's, it's it's deep. They, they Their first several albums for several years were just money and they were totally never known. And it's sad. So Tourniquet is the number one. Uh, or number two, my number one, I have to say it because of the fact that these guys are still not known and set the trend for everybody. And everybody in the secular realm knows who this band is, but you don't. Living Sacrifice, <laughs> hands down. Hands down. Rules of Engagement, one of the greatest metal songs ever written. And I, I can't I can't even begin to tell you guys what they have done for a second. There are secular artists that out there that are like, oh, Living Sacrifice is one of the greatest bands ever. And I... When you hear people say that and you're like, wow, really? Because they started off as a death metal band, a doom metal, and then nobody had ever done it before. The lead singer leaves. What are you going to do? Well, let's, let's change what we do. They shift to this new metal that nobody else did yet. So they were doing music before it was popular. Their style of metal 
superseded everybody else. I guarantee you there's probably literally a hundred bands that heard living sacrifice and their mom made them listen to it because they were, they bought them a guitar and they were turning it up all the time and their mom didn't want them to go to hell. So they bought them a living sacrifice CD. I'll guarantee you there are a hundred guitar players out there that ended up starting a band that are still popular that got their roots from living sacrifice. But then you read their lyrics and it's all about the gospel. It's all about the gospel tourniquet, all about the gospel silage, the gospel, calm children, the God, you know, some of these bands are a little bit more focused and in your face about it than others, but all uh, at the end of the day, these nine bands to me made the world what they, what it is in music today. So there's my whole soapbox. You guys, <laughs> anybody that, uh, uh, that you want to add, do you think I missed the boat on? <clears throat> well, there's a lot project. Yep, there's there's a lot. I mean, you kind of opened up a like. Yeah, you, know, you can talk about all the underrated ones. You can talk about the guys who paved the way, all that. But yeah, personally, I think Demon Hunter helped bridge the gap of clean vocals to to the deathcore, not deathcore, but the Cookie Monster screams. Yeah, you know what I mean. Demon Hunter helped bridge that gap uh, for me, and then. As I Lay Dying was a good one that came along, too, that I really enjoyed. Um, you got into them a little bit, didn't you, Gage? Yep. Who else did you get into? Uh, Devil Wears Prada, uh, Phineas. Um, Zach hasn't remembered his favorite band yet. ABR, baby. Oh, I was saving that. So you want to cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> I was saving that one. <laughs> now you, please share. Okay, just continue. Phineas. Uh, that's, I mean, Fit for a King sometimes. and mm-hmm. uh, That's really all that's coming to my head, but. Fair enough. Yeah. Was there a band that stuck out to you, Kay, before uh, Zach Lewis throws down some of his? Well, I I like the Demon Hunter and they're great. Yeah, yeah, and um, War of Ages. So, give it up, girl. Way <laughs> to go. War of Ages is very in. They're very strong about their. They're they don't care. They will not turn down their message. Their lead singer and lead guitar player, the founding members, always say that they will not go quiet on their faith. They don't care who they make upset, right. and they've stuck to it. Yeah, they have, and they're still very active yep. and good. But Definitely. I felt like people were starting to notice them, so I left them off my list. That's why X Toll got on there. Project eighty six um, is, is a great band that <laughs> was marketed by the best way possible in the nineties, and that's when a, another band wears your shirt. And the guitar player for Lincoln Park, they were playing a, a live concert, and he wore a Project eighty six t shirt. And they are a Christian band, and uh, out of Baltimore, Maryland, and. Yeah, they're they're really good. Their uh, their early stuff is great, and then they kind of they're different, man. They'll they'll change it up on you, and you either like it or you don't. Yeah. But you got to give it to them for having the balls to do what they want to do. If you want to if you want to throw a song out there, I, I I've listened to it six times since I put it on my Spotify the other day. Is Molotov? Molotov is different. It is. It, it, you, I'm gonna I'm gonna make you listen to that before we leave tonight, Kay. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, this sounds like the the Cure, right? Or something. There's from a the total 80s. like '80s influence okay. to that. Yeah, when you hear so it, you're just like, this is so. Aw-. And when a band can pull that off, when they can do you know rock and original they can do soft music original that, music, yeah. yeah, they're not copying anybody. No. They do their own thing. It's pretty cool. No, Truthless Heroes was one of the first albums I really got into by them. Um, Salem Suburbs, I remember listening to it at 11 years old. And when he, he just sings out, um, who I am, who I will be has been decided for me. And like, he just keeps repeating that. And I remember being 11, like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Like, who I am has already been figured out. Like, I don't know it yet, but he does. <laughs> He's singing about the doctrine of election. <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty yeah, cool. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, but Project... Uh, let's see who else can I throw out there that isn't really enough for today. For today, oh, yeah. um, singer Maddie Mullins um, is an on fire, on fire evangelist. He is he is always um, sharing testimonies at shows, being very positive influence on kids. He actually, uh, when Tourniquet came out with an album a couple years ago, uh, he's featured on one of their songs, mm-hmm. like Stereo. Tr- no, that's in there. I forgot the name of the song, but it's about. Um, man's abuse of dogs 
And it's phenomenal. It's a great song. Um, Slavering. Slavering by Tourniquet featuring Matt. That's a, it's fantastic. Wow. Okay. I, I do remember the song. I didn't realize that that was him singing that. Yeah. So for, for today is great. Um, you know what Kay might really like? Maylene. Yeah, Maylene and the Sons of Disasters are one of my favorite bands. They, they, are, they are not known. Like, there was a chick, I, I don't know if it was like Selena Gomez or something, some like popular chick who was on a, a night show saying how she just got done watching Maylene and the Sons of, and the Sons of Disaster in concert. And I was like, what? You know who they are? So, uh, like, two guys from Under Oath uh, left the band. Under Oath, if you didn't know, started out as, as, as a Christian man. Yep. And then I've totally renounced the faith. They were, I watched an interview with them and the guys are saying basically like, somebody asked him a question, answer this. If I was still a Christian today, I would be blank. I would be dead. Is how he responded. Yeah. He just Pretty like, sad. they told, yeah, like they totally just fell off. So still pray for him. Obviously I never personally got into under oath as a kid. They were just um, one of those bands where I was just like, yeah, I, uh. there was one album I was like, um, I cannot remember. 2008. Anything. They de- yeah. uh, they debuted number two on the Billboard charts. charts. Yeah. Debuted. Yeah, they were. As a Christian band. But there were after kids, that, it there was There were kids, speaking of high, who would wear under oath t-shirts all the time. Yeah. And once they hit that notch, you know that they're, there's probably. Yeah. But, but, a, but a couple of guys it. from that band um, founded Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. And the band name comes from an old outlaw mom who had her group of rebel sons in a, in a county in Florida. And they were just, they're like prohibition runners and they were outlaws and they got their name from them, but they're, they're like a Southern death core meets melodic soft rock and stuff like that. It's Metallica <laughs> and Bob Seger got together go. along with, uh, along with Molly Hatchet and there had a go. child. Yeah. Oh it, my gosh. It's hard to explain these guys. Like one of their songs, one of my favorite songs by them, uh, starts out with like, um, hearing crickets and frogs in the summer night and then you hear this banjo come in and then it kicks into just uh, wow. the darn yeah, name they, of the they, song, i'm gonna have to listen you, to that yeah. now. Freaking you really like it they're one of the coolest bands that ever really came yeah, out they're of they're very different um and I, I love the band dropkick murphy's i had did irish rock was you know, Listening to I'm Shipping Up to Boston when it came out on MVP Baseball 05 with Manny Ramirez on the cover. One of the best soundtracks for a video game of all time. And Dropkick Murphys was on there. And uh, yeah, absolutely <laughs> fell in love with them. And I bring them up because there's a band that I guarantee you you have not heard of. And they are out of Chicago. And they have that Irish root. Um, bat- play bagpipes in their song. Have that total. And that's Flatfoot 56. Flatfoot, one word. The number five six, they do a cover of the worship hymn "I'll Fly Away," and it'll move you. Yeah, it's beautiful. It will move you. He played it for me, and I was it's, I it's taken upbeat, aback. Beat and it's driving, and it's an amazing song. But Flatfoot Fifty Six <laughs> has a bunch of albums. They have a song uh, about Ty Cobb talking about uh, the the. Fastest man in, in baseball has the is the dirtiest, and the sharpest cleats are coming for you. Like the sharpest cleats in baseball are coming for you because Ty Cobb would sharpen the spikes, the metal spikes on the bottom of his feet, and uh, intentionally spike guys in the yeah, ankle, yeah. sliding into God, second, third, and home. Um, he was <laughs> shot by his own mother when he was eighteen years old. Ty Cobb has one of the most fascinating biographies you've ever. It it seems like somebody wrote a story. Ty Cobb's story is absolutely captivating. I encourage anyone, but their song "Ty Cobb" uh, was the one that turned me on to that. And I talked to my buddy who I was working with at the at the school. I was like, "Dude, have you heard the Ty Cobb?" He's like, "Yeah, I wrote this or I read this biography about Ty Cobb. You would not believe the type of life he lived." And yeah, anyway, yeah, wow. the baseball player Ty Cobb. <laughs> but Five Foot Fifty Six is another great one, and I'll end it uh, with the band that. Uh, has a very delicate spot in my heart, and that's August Burns Red. August yeah. Burns Red um, came out with a CD called Rescue, or an album called Rescue and Restore. Rescue and Restore came out in 2013, and they came out with that album in the summer, and that summer was the summer that my mom was diagnosed with leukemia. So when the atom bomb was dropped and on our lives, I went out to Best Buy, Blossom Steam, 
and I picked up this album, and I was like, oh, I love August Burns Red. You know, I've listened to those guys. You know, their album previously was Leveler. I remember taking over to Cam's house with Cam, Corey, JJ, and all of us are hanging out playing college football, and I just would play it in the background. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And they had like they, there's a salsa breakdown in one of their songs. Like they're amazing. So Rescue and Restore comes out, and it's funny because they call it today their emotional middle child <laughs> of a release of an album. I I spilled more tears and screamed more screams and according to that song than I ever have in my life, but it came out right when I needed an out. It was my mom dying, you know, the possibility of living life without her, going through all of this emotion, all this turmoil, and then they provide this album in which they wrote a song that I used at her eulogy. It's called Beauty and Tragedy. And it is one of, like, I, it'll pop up on my speaker and I run next. I can't do it <laughs> unless you want to see waterworks happening. No, but uh, August Burns Red, um, their drummer, Matt Griner, is one of the most sweetest human beings. Uh, I love to listen uh, to him Matt talk about his is, faith. Ma- yes. He, he loves Jesus Christ. With absolutely all his heart. Is a, adores the Father in heaven. And the whole band does. The whole band does. Um, there's a song called Meridian. It's an instrumental. And Jake Lures in the, mid- in the middle of it uh, screams out. Um, a passage from Jeremiah and it's those who live um, by the sword will find favor in the desert and just the way they do it is just so powerful but yeah ABR ABR to me and it's not because I was born in August it's because <laughs> they and it's funny you remember what I told you how they got their name yeah so they they started as high school buddies 15 16 years old in suburbia Pennsylvania uh, I don't know each other as buddies, and so they start to form a band, and um, they were trying to come up with a name, and they, there was a headline on the local paper, um, a story about how a girl burned her boyfriend's dog, set the dog on fire as an act of revenge for breaking up, and the title of it was August Burns Red. So they took that and name their band after because they were all moved by the wow. story yeah. and they thought it wasn't like you know it wasn't like an homage to it don't, don't get me wrong but no they like to take it like as like a scarlet letter yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, I, and there's a I, you know it's funny because a lot of the bands we've mentioned tonight a lot of the groups and a lot of the you know not everybody like you, you might not like something that we brought up or can't you know you could listen to them and go man i just can't get it. and that's okay that's a that's the beautiful thing about music is that it is art and it should appeal to what your ears not because it's popular that's what i hate about the word pop culture pop music because pop is short for popular right and i don't like things necessarily you know yeah i mean there's sometimes a song comes out you know drops a jupiter by like train comes on at first and i don't really care the fact that he mentions a comment about uh, heaven's overrated right but i remember the first time i heard that song and i was like wow that's gonna be a hit Little did I know that Magic 107.7 <laughs> to this day chugs it down three times a day. I'm like 20 years later. Stop already, right? Mm-hmm. So popular music is is like is is burning my ears until I can't stand it anymore. So I can't listen to radio. I've got to listen to what I like, and it's like I think a lot of people are the same way, right? Yeah. yeah. You don't like Patsy Cline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, there's there's a there's a comfort to listening it. to the same music. <laughs> yes, obviously we do it right. There's m- memories. There's a feeling of just being comfortable, nostalgia, whatever. But to consistently put the same ten to fifteen songs on repeat daily, like you're choking yourself out, man. Like there's a freaking, you're defeating yeah. the purpose. It's a of beautiful art. library, Absolutely. and and no one's gonna come up to Ornette Coleman or Miles Davis or. Uh, Charlie Parker and go, hey, I, I don't like the way that you freestyle that solo. Then you don't understand jazz. Yeah, right, right. It's an art. It's a, it's a, it's a demographic because I want to do this in this way, and this is what I like to do. Music is really beautiful to the in the eye of the beholder, and I just we we just really wanted to do an episode tonight, um, th- th- this particular time, to just encourage you to go out and listen to some other music, especially if you like any kind of. Like I said, that's why we kind of broke it up and had you, you know, some softer. I'm not doing anything on contemporary. Contemporary gets enough love on their own. Yep. So not uh, doing th- it. These are the people that, that you wouldn't know existed unless they and, were. And you should. Yeah. And you're doing yourself a huge disservice by not finding them out. Absolutely. Uh, impending Doom is another one. Oh, my gosh. They, we they, left them out. They Almost, provide. Impending Doom to me 
can't. I was just thank you guys. <laughs> when when I found them, I was like, thank you, because I, I'm a, I like I like some pretty heavy stuff. Okay, like y'all probably look at me and go, what is wrong with you? <laughs> right, but. I just think that the ability for a human being to transform their voice into this guttural, like, there's a guy, he's not a Christian. In fact, I'd even argue he's a little bit on the satanic side. Uh, his name is Alex the Terrible. He has a band called Slaughter to Prevail. Oh, uh, yeah. He's Russian. Yep. Those guys are... They are brutal. Yeah. I don't listen to them. I can't, because I get, I get convicted. That's one band I do get convicted. But yeah. Alex the, Tell, the Terrible can do this thing with his voice. I've never heard a human being do. And it's, oh, it's the most... In, he did a rendition of We Will Rock You, a cappella, like banging his chest, like... Just pounding his <laughs> chest. Yeah. And then, buddy, you're right. Like, but the way he freaking does, you're like, how? Yeah. How? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, this, uh, I just I have an appreciation for doing stuff like that because that's not something everybody can do. No. And their lead singer of Impending Doom, Brooks, um, Brooks can do things um, that a lot of most people can't. And he right. loves God. Yeah. He he talks about you know being on tour and you know people are like, well, how how can you associate yourself with these people? He's like, because I love people and the Christ that resides inside of me loves them too. So that's why I need to reach out to them. And think about the light. Yeah, it it completely is. And he has no prohibition talking about it. It's beautiful. (laughs) You know, when you think about, I think I've heard people say uh, two quick amazing anecdotes that that were were funny that I wanted to say before we end tonight. One is the, a lot of people will say, you know, well, you know, they, they, I literally heard somebody say, well, you know, you only, they're only Christian because um, they could get signed to a record label. And I thought, <laughs> you're, you're a moron for even thinking that. Yeah, you, because you, being Christian gets you by in so many things in this life. And if you're, if you're in a death metal band and you're playing a death metal concert with other bands, you're not liked very well. No. So, oh, so no. you don't understand that, you know, if these you, people, these guys are the, uh, are the drummer boys in the civil war. They are on the front line. It's just smacking their snare. And these guys are launching a freaking attack, man. Like all barrel, all guns are pointed on you and they're just playing paradiddles. The, they don't he, care. He said, this is a, a war music. So many bands, not saying a thing. So many groups that preach their hate. Not me, not me, not me. Flesh and blood are not the enemy. You will never have me deceived. Kingdom war is what I believe. You are blinded by the true reality. There is a battle that you can't see. Just think about that for a minute. Mm-hmm. He he's launching. It's called war music, and he launches into and you know that's just one of many songs from Impending Doom. But they're amazing. They're amazing. There's. I hope you guys got some out of it. Look, and if you have more questions or if you want any kind of uh, uh, more feedback, you can email Becoming us. The, oh gosh, this was a bad idea because now it's all coming to me. Becoming the archetype. No, that's a good band to throw in there. Becoming the archetype has songs like The Ocean Walker and The Planet Maker and is totally glorifying his creation. That's a great point. And it's it's those guys have some really good stuff. You know, do. when when I saw the when I went like Google can sometimes still do Wikipedia can still be a decent outlet. If you do Christian metal bands, there's a list on Wikipedia that's actually legit. Um, if you do, it's hard Wikipedia, rock, so therefore nothing's legit. Right, right. But <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I know, but if, if you do rock Christian rock bands or hard rock bands, no, they have uh, you have bands on there that don't need Anybody to be on there. Can click edit, yeah, and put in what they want. Well, presently, go and click. It's you know, ridiculous. Cl- click on that and go to the Wikipedia page, and then just print it off. As of right now, you know, in the middle of February of 2022. There's not a lot of people going to the Christian music now. Right, so there's it's probably a lot more. Yeah, well, just like if you if you Google search what is all millennialism, yeah, and you exactly. pull up gotquestions.org and you know how many people are doing that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that question, by the way, gets answered by me on on the gotquestions.org. If you're wondering why I brought that up, and nobody you know nobody knows that. Sure did. It it, Dad's it, the Google it, provider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a big disclaimer. We do not hold to this uh, this viewpoint. So I got a, I got a disclaimer on mine, which is great. 
from the uh, editor and the owner of the you web page. Cultish weirdo. I know, I know, I know exactly. Um, Kay, thank you for listening to some of this music and being open to check it out. We Absolutely. really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. You. Absolutely. Loved it. I really did. I enjoyed it, and, and I'm glad. I Actually, I'm going to have to listen to this back to start writing down all these names <laughs> so I can go back and listen to well, it. Well, Engage is going to do something as people are listening to this particular episode. Some of those bands, he's... Uh, um, some doing video. Some, yeah, some video yeah. there and some little awesome. uh, tidbits, and so we're going to see what we can get awesome. away with yeah. on this one. Hey, uh, for Zach, for Gage, for Kay, um, and Patrick, thank you again very much. We're going to just ask you this. Um, if you have any questions, please email us at... Uh, freaks of the vine at gmail.com freaks of the vine one word at gmail.com let us know if you like this episode or other episodes let us know what you would like us to talk about in the future um we are going to do one over trying to get uh, steer you in the right direction of podcast probably pretty soon and that way we can help you guys know where to go get good information because a lot of people don't know where to go and so until then um you guys thank you for so much for the spirited conversation i think this one was a long one and because we have a lot to say about this topic and yep. we i feel like just great. scratched the still so much more <laughs> we <laughs> did yeah. we might have to do take two soon uh, how's that okay. bringing out this topic with you and i <laughs> and i'm really i'm really impressed by the fact that gage has a lot of knowledge about this these bands too and Kay did some research. I was really proud of both of you guys for knowing that. So yeah, thanks, guys, because it would have been really sucky and boring for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to close this in prayer on the air, if you guys don't mind. Thanks, Lord, for bringing, letting us all get together. We give you all the glory, Lord God, um, for all that you have done for us and all that you're doing. Yeah, Lord, we know that there's a lot of musicians out there who are playing music, that are worshiping you, that are teaching about you. And we just want to make sure that we share them with the world, Lord. We, we, uh, we know, Lord. If we had a conviction, if we, if we knew that listening to certain music was was uh, uh, wrong, then we get a conviction. And we know that I know that I listen to the old secular metal stuff of the back in the day. Um, I don't feel right, and I know that that's because it's not pleasing to you. But when I know I hear some of these groups, I know it's pleasing to you. And we pray, God, that you would bless these musicians and bless the people who can listen to them because there's a lot of evil out there in the world. And all we're trying to do is give them another outlet um, that praises your name. We give you all the glory and praise in your precious name. We pray, Lord God. Amen. 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 All right. For all of us, you guys, thanks for tuning in to Freaks of the Vine tonight. We appreciate you. We will bless you guys and we will see you next time. Until then, we are out.